Bible Church this morning. Um, I'd love for you guys to turn to somebody next to you and shake a hand and tell them that you're glad to see them here this morning. But don't lie about it. All right. Why don't you all have a seat or find your seat again? Again, I'd love to welcome you here to Mountain Bible Church. If you're new here, which it looks like maybe you're not, <laughs> you've got the drill down pretty well, which is great. Um, you may not know uh, because if you're new, but yesterday was Don's birthday. Turned 27. Yeah, he takes cash or gift cards. It's okay, whatever you feel. Um, no, we're really blessed here at Mountain Bible with awesome, awesome team members. This is Cindy Corbin and Don Gibson. This is Dave Drewy and Dave Yoder. We have a lot of Daves here, so if, if you yell out Dave, if you're looking for somebody, you're probably half right. 
And this is, Dave, sorry, I already got you, Dave, and this is Raynell Matthews, and we get to worship with you. We're so blessed to be able to be here with you. And, um, so if you are new, that's us, and for us, we'd love to get to know you better. There's a card in the back of your seat. If you'd fill that out, um, you can take it out to the, like, octagonal building thing, not the big, huge one, the Ramada, but the little one, um, and they have a gift for you as a bag with a coffee cup in there. And um, you can get to know us a little bit better. We'd love to get to know you. So we'd also love to thank you all who are regular givers here at Mountain Bible Church. It means a lot for us to be able to continue to do the ministries that we do. Um, we do a lot of missions. Uh, we just had a couple, three teams come back in the last month, two from Mexico and one's from El Salvador. We're going to get to hear more from those teams, um, both in your emails. And then uh, we're going to have some guests come and talk to us as well. And so um, thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of what we do here, for giving and being faithful in that way. Um, it means a lot to us. Uh, some other ways that we do ministry, I'm going to have Jed Morrison come up, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what him and his wife Susan do um, as far as our widow's ministry. And then I'm going to ask them to pray to launch us right back into our service. So come on up, guys. Um, well, it's a good thing we're tall. <laughs> Hi. We're Jed and Susan Morrison, and we're the leaders of Bright Horizons Widows Ministry. And so there are, there are widows in our congregation, so we want to share with them. There's a verse, oh, verse 68, the end of verse 4, no, Psalm 68, the end of verse 4, and all of verse 5 says this, His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows in his holy habitation. Now, how awesome is that, that God who is all-powerful and has authority over everything, that he has a, uh, a, takes a particular care for orphans and for widows. The membership uh, at, at this church, Mountain Bible Church, and the leaders and Bright Horizons Ministry um, have a care for widows. And it's through this care that we exemplify what God's care for us is. And in doing that, we, we, we're grateful for the widows. We're grateful that we get to just love on them and we exemplify what God does for us. So Susan's going to talk about what Bright Horizons Ministry, what we do. <laughs> Bright Horizons was started years ago by uh, Myrna Har and a uh, few of the other widows. And some of you attended at that time. We've, continue, we've decided to continue that ministry since Myrna's moved to the valley. Um, this Thursday is our February 2nd meeting at 1145 right outside um, in the Ramada. We serve lunch. We have a praise time. We have devotion time, the ladies' fellowship, and we have musicians. And, and this week is going to be Dave and Dawn, so we're really excited. We've had Bobby and Krista and Gil and Tammy, and... So we're really excited to have those. Some of the widows have come through the grief share program here at church, and they attend other churches. So we invite them to also come. You don't have to come attend Mountain Bible to be able to participate in our luncheons. Um, we encourage the ladies to reach out to each other, whether that's starting a Bible study, meeting together, going to the movies, going to lunch, whatever they want to do. In fact, one of the... Um, a Bible study has already been started in one of the ladies' homes, so that's blessing them in other ways. We also encourage them to um, let us know if they want to do crafts, have a game day outside of our regular monthly meetings, which is typically on the first Thursday of every month. I think that's about it. We're really excited to, uh, these notes are worthless, you know. <laughs> you write them at home and you rewrite them and, you know. Let me add. So, wait till you guys have to come up here. Let, let me add that this is, this, this is the first time I've used one of these. 
this is the first time I used a cell phone, so I'm a little nervous. So, <laughs> okay. But I want to add that Susan cooks, and she makes great meals for the ladies. Ooh. And I get to have leftovers. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. But the other thing we do is we'll go visit the widows, too. We'll, we'll call them up. We'll visit with them over the phone. We visit the widows in their homes. The other thing, too, is Susan and I love to hear their stories because the widows have stories to tell. They start at the beginning of their life, and they're where they're at today, and the loss of their husband, and what they're doing, and how they depend on God. And it's such a testimony for the other widows and for us. Okay, your so. time's up. Okay. Say a right. prayer. Let me, let me. We're okay. going to pray. Who takes the lead here? <laughs> okay. We take All right. Turns. Lord, uh, we're just grateful for today, and we love you so much. This is the day you've made, and we rejoice in it. And, Lord, uh, it's great to be here. It's great to minister together. It's great to sing together and also to hear the word. Lord, we praise you and give you all the glory and honor. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. All right, stand up. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who leaves the orphan, a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations? Truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We sing, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you bear my cross oh you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus 
yes, I sing for all that you've done for me. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful generations so why would he fail now he won't he won't and I've still got joy and chaos I've got peace that makes no sense and I won't be going on I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through every season So why would He fail now? He won't He won't sing. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. Spirit of 
God, we want to know you more and more, hanging on every word. Because when you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do, it changes us changes what we see what we see when you come in the room when you do what only you can do it changes us changes what we see what we seek you're changing everything Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we're leaning into all you are, everything else can wait. When of the living God, Spirit of the living God, come now and breathe upon our hearts, come now and have your way, because when you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, changes what we see, what we see. When you come in the room, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, changes what we see, what we see. You're changing everything. When you move, you move all our fears. And when you move, you move us to tears. And when you move, you move all our fears. And when you move, you move us to tears. And when you changes us, changes what we see, what we see. When you come in the room, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, changes what we see, what we seek. You're changing everything. to you this morning, expectant, Lord. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work in this place today. We have things in our hearts and our lives that need to be moved and rooted out, Lord. We have areas where we need encouragement. We trust in you, God. Speak through Billy today, we ask in, my, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So we're going to pick up back in Acts chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles there or, or flip there on your phone, whatever you're using. 
Acts chapter 2 is where we'll pick up. And, and uh, as, as I've been thinking about, and, and Pastor Dave and I have been praying about the book of Acts and what we feel like the Lord is wanting to do in us individually and in us as a congregation, um, it's really, a, especially these first few weeks, we're, we're looking to the Lord to do a new work in us through his spirit. We're, we've, we've titled the, the, uh, the study through the book of Acts as the, the genesis of the church. And if you've been with us through our study through the book of Genesis, you know that there was, there's a heavy emphasis on walking by faith, right? We, we look so much at uh, walking by faith through Abraham's life and through, through Joseph's life and, and the others. And, and so there's this, we've just come through this season of really questioning or, or challenging being challenged to walk by faith. And now we come into this season where we're, we're going through the book of Genesis, or the book of Acts, the genesis of the church. And, and I believe the emphasis is, is not only walking by faith, but, but walking in the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus told the disciples. As he, right before he ascended, he said, I want you to wait for the empowering. For the baptism with the Spirit. I want you to wait for the Spirit to come upon you. And so we're continuing in that this morning. Last week, Pastor Dave took us through verse 13, where we saw the, the 120 in the upper room waiting for that which Jesus told them to wait for. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And 10 days of waiting, after 10 days of waiting and praying, with thanksgiving and supplication and sharing scripture and seeking God's face. The, the room was filled with a mighty rushing wind, and, and there was the, the, this, this fire that filled the room, and, and it settled on each one of them, and they began to speak in tongues, miraculous tongues, they, tongues they had never spoken in before. And, and all of those who had come from distant lands all across Israel were there in Jerusalem to celebrate the, Pen the, the Feast of Pentecost or weeks or, or first fruits, as Pastor Dave pointed out last week. And as this thing happened, as the Holy Spirit filled that room with a mighty rushing wind and they began to praise God in different tongues, those who had traveled from the distant lands heard this and they were, they were drawn to it. What is this sound? What is this thing that's happening. What is this event? And they were drawn to it. And verse 6 tells us that when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Now, it's a bit hard for us to kind of uh, visualize, or at least for me, we've got the, the, the 120 in the upper room, the Holy Spirit falls upon them in the upper room, the multitudes are just in the streets outside. They're, they're there in the city. The city is just full of people there to worship. And, and so we're not sure when they heard this voice did they, or, or this, this event taking place, did the multitudes outside, was it because the windows were open? Did they just kind of gather to the, the, the base of the, of the building there outside in the street, kind of look it up like, what's going on? Or did the 120 begin to spill out into the streets? as they were worshiping the Lord in these, these miraculous tongues? Or, or did some of the, the multitude out of curiosity begin to make their way into the upper room? We don't know exactly how it all played out, but they heard them speaking of God's wonderful works in their own native tongue. And they knew, or they, they were perceiving, wait a minute, these are, these are Galileans. These are, these, are, these are people who are, well educated, they, they shouldn't know how to speak our language. What is it that's happening right now? Well, however it happened, Peter saw an opportunity. And so Peter stood up and began to address the multitudes that had gathered as a result of this commotion. Look with me at verse 14. We're going to read verse 14 through uh, verse 21. It says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. 
For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maid servant, men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my, my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love the way we see the preaching of God's word working in conjunction with the miraculous move of the Spirit in this passage. There, there are in some circles sort of a, a, an odd uh, viewpoint or perspective that, that somehow Bible study or the preaching of God's word is less spiritual than prayer or worship or moving in the gifts of the Spirit. But that's not the case at all. It's not as though Peter quenched the Spirit by preaching to the, to the multitude No, he was moving in the Spirit. That's what we see here. He was moving in the Spirit. And as he addressed the multitudes, he says, look, we're not drunk because in verse 13, we see some were saying, wow, what is this in amazement? And some were dismissing it, ah, they're drunk. And Peter says, we're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning for crying out loud. This is a move of God. This This is a miraculous work of God. He says, what you're seeing is in accordance with what the prophet Joel prophesied would take place hundreds of years earlier. He prophesied that God was going to pour out his spirit in the last days. Now, Peter's not saying that this event was the fulfillment of all that Joel, the prophet Joel, prophesied. He's not saying this this fulfills what Joel prophesied. But what he's saying is, I I think this is the beginning of it. Essentially, what we're seeing here is that Jesus' coming marks the the last days. So so Jesus' arrival marked the beginning of the last days. The last days is is a season. It's a period of time, or or maybe some refer to it as the the time of the Messiah. It's a period of time, and it will... It will stretch until his second coming. The the work of the Holy Spirit began here at Pentecost as far as the pouring out and and coming upon and filling in this way. And it's stretching all the way until today and until the second coming of Christ. Notice Peter's boldness. I love this. There is a marked difference between the, the disciples, the apostles before, for Pentecost and the apostles after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had come upon them. You, you remember, think about the Gospels. Think about the disciples throughout the Gospels, their time walking with Jesus on this earth. Think about the, the, what we see in them. They're, they're often confused by what Jesus is teaching, right? They misunderstood him often. They, they often argued about what? who would be the greatest in the kingdom, right? They were focused on themselves. They were focused on, on, will I be glorified? Will I be magnified? They were marked by fear. There was a a fear that was prevalent among them. And then after Pentecost, there's a boldness. There's a humility. There's a unity. They're, They're working and operating in the gifts of the Spirit, After Pentecost, they're different men. They've been changed. And it's really the difference between, as Pastor Dave put it last week, trying to swim on your own, right? Or getting into the master's boat and setting the sail. That's why I've titled today's message, Setting the Sail. I, I love the analogy that Pastor Dave has been sharing with us. 
in this last couple of weeks about setting the sail and what that speaks to us about the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so the difference between the, the apostles, the disciples before Pentecost and after Pentecost is, is the difference between tr- trying to operate in your own strength and, and operating in the strength of the Lord, in the enabling of his Holy Spirit. Even as believers, we can choose to face the day in our own strength, or we can choose to face the day in the empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's really our choice. Am I going to be submitted to him, allowing him to work in and through me, or am I going to try to swim on my own? Am I going to try to just strive and, and make it happen and pull myself up by my bootstraps? Or am I going to rest? Am I going to get in the boat and hoist the sail? It's our choice. Dave taught us last week that the word used for they were filled in the original language is a, is a one-time, once-for-all, done deal. It's, it's a, when they were filled... They were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a permanent work of the Holy Spirit. They they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But Dave also pointed out that there are subsequent fillings for specific times and tasks. And so we have filled sort of with with uh, the tense of, of being a permanent filling, and then there are subsequent fillings. We're not, it's not just a one time deal. The Lord continues to come upon us. In John 14, 17, Jesus, as he was preparing the disciples for his departure, he was telling them about the Holy Spirit. And he says to them in John 14, 17, he says, the Spirit is with you and will be in you. Okay? That's that's that filled moment. He's with you now, so that's, he's outside of you, with you, leading you, guiding you, convicting you of sin, all of those things. But he will be in you. That's that, that once for all filling that Pastor Dave was talking about. And then Ephesians 4.30 puts it this way. We will be sealed for the day of redemption. Okay, so that's, what, that's that being filled once and for all, that's what Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will be in you. We are, we are sealed for the day of redemption. When you place faith in Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He dwells you. He takes up residence in you in that moment. Okay, so he was with you. Now, once you place faith in Jesus, he's in you. Okay? But then Jesus says, Jesus says in, in verse 8 of the first chapter of Acts, He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So notice, Jesus uses three different prepositions for the relationship of man to the Holy Spirit. With, in, and upon. Those are three different relationships, three different orientations of the Holy Spirit. He's with, he's in, that's that once and for all filling, and then there's the coming upon. That's what we see at Pentecost. He's coming upon them. He's doing a new work in them. Before the death and burial of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with man and then occasionally upon man, but but he did not dwell within man because because our, our sin wasn't dealt with yet. But once we've been justified by what Jesus did on the cross, the Holy Spirit can take up residence in us. And so now we have the Holy Spirit with and in, and then we have the, the, the gift of, the, the option of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. All this to say, you may have the filling of the Spirit. You may be sealed. You may be a believer in, in, in Christ and, be, and have the filling of the Spirit, the seal of the Spirit in you. You all do if you've placed faith in Christ. But m- you may not know whether or not you've experienced that coming upon of the Holy Spirit. You may not be able to recall or, or, or you may not be aware necessarily if you've experienced that in your life as a believer. And so the question then becomes, well, how do I know? Or when does that happen? Or, or how does that 
kind of thing take place. And I think, as Dave mentioned last week, there's no formula. There's no formula as to how God moves or when God moves or how God speaks or when God speaks. Dave went through the scriptures and, and pointed out multiple different locations and times that when the Lord moved in different ways. He spoke in different ways. He, he revealed himself in different ways at different times. And so there's no formula to how do I receive this coming upon of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.3 tells us that in Christ we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And what does that mean? Well, that means that as a child of God, he is holding nothing back from us. Right? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. As a child of God, he is holding nothing back from us. So does that mean that we experience every blessing in the heavenly places? Every spiritual blessing? Not necessarily. Right? Because there are some things that some of us as Christ followers are, are, are we still, we're struggling with. Do I experience perfect peace? Do I experience perfect rest? Do I always experience perfect hope? Do, am I always enjoying the understanding that I've been accepted by the Lord, I, that I'm totally justified in Christ, just as if I'd never sinned at all? Those are all our promises, but we don't necessarily always experience the blessings that have been given to us. The Lord is not withheld from us. In some ways, it's up to us to experience that. Have you ever seen just a massive, beautiful waterfall? You've seen a, just a massive waterfall coming down and crashing down on, on rocks below or into a pool at the bottom. Have you ever hiked down to the bottom of the waterfall? If you have, you know that it's really up to you how much of that waterfall you physically experience, right? You can stay back at a safe distance and, and, and maybe feel a little spray, you know, just a little mist on your face. Or you can get a little closer and the, and the mist gets stronger. Or you can get right underneath the waterfall and it just drenches you. It just soaks you all the way down. Well, in some ways, in some ways, that's a lot like the filling of the Spirit. As Pastor Dave said last week, we've got to set the sail. We've got to position ourselves in such a way that the Holy Spirit is filling our lives. That the Holy Spirit is filling our sails. We, we, when you position yourself for the, for the wind to catch the sail, the wind's got to be at your back, right? For the wind to catch the sail. Or another way to say it is, you've got to be facing the direction the wind is going for it to catch your sail. Or another way to put it is, you've got to be going the way of the Spirit. You've got to be walking in conjunction with or in agreement with the Lord for him to be at your back filling your sails. If you're walking in opposition, well, then you're, you're, there's going to be a lot, of, a, a lot of resistance there. You're walking in opposition to the wind or to the, the moving of God. There's resistance there. But as soon as I submit and say, okay, God, I'm going your way. Let's go. The sails are filled and we're moving. That's largely up to us. That's largely up to us. We gotta let the Holy Spirit capture us, like the wind captures the sail. The way that works is we we seek Him, like we see the disciples doing. We're submitted to Him, like we see with the disciples. We're we're desiring Him, like we see with the disciples. And the Lord moves. The Lord fills our sails. Peter saw the opportunity and was moved by the Spirit to step out in faith. But he had to choose that, right? The Lord didn't force Peter to stand up and open his mouth. The Lord didn't force Peter to stand up and say, men and brethren, men of Judea and all Jerusalem. The Lord didn't force him to do that. He was moved by the Spirit, and he chose to submit. He chose to say, okay, God, I'm doing it. I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to open my mouth. 
I'm going to stand up and I'm going to speak the truth. It was a decision that Peter made. And when he did that, the Lord showed up. The Lord showed up. Years ago, I was in Mexico with uh, my family and some friends, and uh, one of our friends said, hey, you want to go out sailing on my catamaran? I'd never been sailing before, and so I said, yeah, that'd be great. That sounds like a lot of fun. So we get out on the catamaran, and I didn't know anything about a catamaran or sailing or anything. And he's, like, doing stuff with ropes and setting things and tying things off and loosening things and all, all kinds of stuff. And we're, we're just kind of sitting on the water, you know, and he's doing his thing, and and and. You know, we're moving, but not much is happening. And all of a sudden, he sets the sail, and boom, it just, it just exploded. I mean, it just, it just filled with wind, and we started moving. We started flying, and it was awesome. And all of a sudden, we're, and then we're up on one pontoon, and we're just we're leaning out over the pontoon and trying to counterweight the, the wind, and we're just cutting through the water. It was incredible. And then all of a sudden, his hat flies off. And he reaches back for his hat, and he falls off. <laughs> and so here I am, flying through the water, and I'm looking back at him like, my eyes are there. I'm like, what do I do? And he goes, break the sail, break the sail, break the sail. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what break the sail means. What in the world am I supposed to do? Finally, I figured it out. I broke the sail, but it had been a ways. He had a bit of a swim. To catch up. When the Holy Spirit fills your sail, you are going places. You are doing things. You, there is action. There is movement. There is, there is fruit and evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Just like when that sail caught that wind and we took off. It's not always super exciting. There are some days that are sort of mundane, or there are some days that we are just, it just we're just faithful. We're just faithfully moving forward, taking steps of faith and, and obedience. But there will be evidence when the Holy Spirit has grabbed a hold of your hearts and my hearts. Let's look at verse 22, 22 through 28. Peter continues in his sermon, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make my, me full of joy in your presence. Notice Peter doesn't pull any punches here. He's, he's not looking for, for popularity here, right? He's speaking the truth. He reminds them, he says, you saw, many of you saw and experienced Jesus working miracles. You know that God worked signs and wonders through him in your midst. Undeniable, clear evidence that he is the Messiah. And that his death, he, know, he says, and that his death, is on your hands. His death is on your hands. Interesting, in, in verse 23, in one sentence, he says both, you're responsible for his death and that his death was a sovereign work of the Lord. It's, it's both of those things at the same time. It was God's plan all along. And unlike any other man who's ever lived, death couldn't hold him. Why? Because the wages of sin is death, and he lived a sinless life. He was perfect. Death could not hold him. He conquered the grave. He conquered sin. He conquered death. Again, look at Peter. Look at the, the evidence of the work of the Spirit. The boldness that we see in Peter just over a month ago. It was just over a month before this that Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was. 
three times in the span of just a few hours. Three times. Because he was worried about what people would think of him. He was afraid of the consequences. And, and, and so he denied even knowing Jesus. And here, he's standing before the multitudes and proclaiming it. The boldness that we see is a result of the work of the Spirit in him. And if we want to experience the work of the Spirit in our lives, we're going to need to step out in faith. We're going to need to take steps of faith. And they'll look different for all of us at different times. But we just need to be surrendered to and submitted to the, the working of and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Step out in faith. Allow yourself, as Dave put it last week, to, to, to be out of your depth. That's when you'll experience the work of God. That's when you'll experience the enabling of, of the Holy Spirit. Is when I, I step out into faith in such a way that I'm, I'm out of my depth. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, I, this is beyond me. This is above me. Lord, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. And he'll lift us up. And he'll meet us in that place. The first church that I served in was an interesting church. It was actually a college youth group, so to speak. It was a college group, a college Bible study. And, and it was just growing, and it was growing, and it was growing, and they needed somebody to lead them. They didn't have really a leader. They needed somebody to lead them, and, and there was this, this guy named John Minor who was there in the community who, had, who was a pastor um, who'd kind of become disillusioned with ministry, and he, and he decided he was done with ministry altogether, and he was just working in the community and still faithful to Jesus and loving God and loving people, but just didn't want to be in ministry. And, and these, these uh, college kids knew him, a few of them, and they came to him and they said, John, will you please lead our group? And, and he said, no, 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 that's, that's not my thing anymore. I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to do that. And they, and they begged him and he said, no, no, no. And so they, they kind of quit. Well, well, then another, a few months went by and, and uh, they just need somebody to fill in one week. They said, okay, John, we know you don't want to just take over the leading of the group, but how about just one week? Just one week, just come and, come and teach. And he was reluctant, but he agreed. And when he got there, and he saw what God was doing, he just couldn't believe it. And he was just so excited about what God was doing. And it was so simple. There were none of the politics of church ministry. And there, were none of the, there, were, there was none of that kind of, the, the trappings of those kinds of things. And it was very simple. And he said, okay, I can do this. Well, that thing just exploded. That group just exploded. And then somebody in the community gave them a property. They gave them a building, a church building. And property, and so they, they moved into that, and it exploded even more. Well, then high school kids started to come because there were all these college kids there. Well, then their parents wondered what was going on, and so then their parents started to come. So then we have families there. And I kid you not, it was standing room only every Sunday. Standing room only. I mean, it was jam-packed people standing along the walls, sitting on the floor. The place was filled. There was an overflow room where we had to project it onto a TV in, in another section of the building. It was packed as well. It was incredible. And he was overwhelmed. Pastor John was overwhelmed. He didn't want any of that. And he said, he said, I, can't, I feel like the disciples, when Jesus said to cast your net on the other side, and they did, and, I, and they couldn't even pull it into the boat. There were so many fish. He said, essentially, I'm just out of my depth. I'm overwhelmed. And it was in that place of just being reliant, 100% reliant on the Spirit, that God just did incredible things, amazing things. And I got to be a part of that for a few years, and it was just such a neat experience. But it was because all of us were out of our depth. All of us were just in a place of going, Lord, if you don't show up, we're out of luck. We don't know what to do with all these people. We don't know what to do with, in, in this situation. And it was an incredible thing to be a part of. Verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you, I think he already has been, of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, that Jesus would come from the lineage of David. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption, that Jesus God has raised up, of which you all 
are witnesses. He's saying, hey, you, you all love David. David was a hero in his day. He's saying, you all love David. We all revere David. But guess what? He's dead and buried. He's not, he's not alive. But Jesus, who, who came through the lineage of David, the Messiah, the grave couldn't hold him. He's alive. He's working. He's, he's moving among us still. And this is the case for us as well. Like the Israelites, we have those that we, we consider kind of heroes, don't we? There are those that, that we, we quote them, we revere them, we, we appreciate them, we, we look to them as examples. And it doesn't matter how amazing any of those men or women are, none of them holds a candle to Jesus Christ. None of them holds a candle to our Savior, the one that, that is alive. He's not in a grave somewhere. He's not in the ground somewhere. He's, he's now living and active. And he says, Peter says, you guys have seen this. Many of you have witnessed Jesus in his resurrection. You know this is true. We're not making this up. As, P, as Paul said, the Apostle Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he, he was seen to as many as 500 at one time after his resurrection. You know this, Peter is saying. In verse 33 through 36, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, the Holy Spirit, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, speaking of the Father speaking to Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What a powerful witness. What a powerful witness. I mean, this was not a popular message in Jerusalem. This was the one that they had shouted a little over a month before, crucify, crucify, crucify. And Peter says, he's alive. He's living. He's sitting at the right hand of God. His enemies are made his footstool. He is powerful. He is the, the Messiah. He is the Savior. Peter is proclaiming this with boldness among the people. We'll see the outcome of Peter's message next week. Dave broke this up. He gets, to, he gets the, 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 the fun part of next week. But the question is, where are we this morning? Where are you this morning? Are you still in the place where the, the Holy Spirit is with you on the outside? Convicting you of your sin? convincing you, calling you to understand the righteousness of God and to, and to see that Jesus is your Messiah? If, if you are, then the, the, the prophecy of Joel is true for you. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If that's you this morning, take the step of faith to cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe. I believe. Jesus, that you're alive. I believe that you truly did conquer death. I believe that you are the Savior, my Savior. And, and repent of your sin and call out to him. Joel prophesied and the, and the scriptures proclaim it's true. If you'll call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But what about most of us in the room? Most of us in the room, we've, we've been sealed with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as we place faith in Christ. But are our sails hoisted and filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we experiencing the filling, the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Again, it's not a one-time deal. There are subsequent fillings. Our salvation is sealed. We're sealed by the Spirit for salvation. But the coming upon of the Holy Spirit, empowering us to, to do what we do each day and to step out into the ministries God's called us to, those are subsequent fillings. Those, those take place as we submit ourselves to the Lord 
and position ourselves going his direction and say, okay, God, without you, I'm sunk. You're the only one that can do this thing. Can you recall days past that you anticipated the moving of God more than you do now? Was there a time in your life where you just kind of saw the Lord moving all over the place? Where you just, you just thought, oh, that's the Lord. Oh, that's the Lord. Oh, I can see God moving here. I can see God moving there. And you anticipated each day, God's going to do some good stuff today. And have you, have you drifted from that? Have you drifted from that in your walk with God? If you have, or maybe you haven't, maybe you're, maybe you're firing on all cylinders. Maybe you're just, you are just loving Jesus and excited about the work of God. And, you, and you're in a place of understanding, I need it every day, Lord. Do it again. Do it again. Then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity. I want to I wanna just give you an action point this morning. While the worship team comes up and sings this last song, the song is called New Wine. It speaks of that, that fresh work of the Spirit in our lives. I want you to just step out of your seat and come forward. And, and that's just to say, Lord, I'm submitted. Lord, I'm, I'm surrendered. Lord, do in me what I cannot do for myself. If you're not feeling the Holy Spirit moving you in that way this morning, that's okay. That's all right. There's no guilt. There's no shame. If you don't step out of your seat, fine. Maybe you can't step out of your seat, but you're able to say in your heart, Lord, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm setting the sail. The Lord knows. The Lord sees. This is an action point to say, Lord, I'm stepping out in faith. I want you to do a new work in my life. I want you to fill me. I want you to meet me in this place. And I want to be your vessel. I want to be your tool for your kingdom. Amen? Lord, we thank you, God, that you have made yourself so available to us. What an incredible thing, Lord, that, that you, have, you have sent us your spirit, the helper, the comforter, the counselor, the enabler. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Lord, we want all that you have for us. You've held nothing back from us as your children. You've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And yet maybe we're standing afar off. Your blessings are flowing down like a waterfall, like a massive waterfall. And maybe we've positioned ourselves a little far off so that we're experiencing some of your blessings, but not, not what you desire for us. Lord, this morning, we want to step into that flow of your blessings. We want to step into, we want to position ourselves to receive all that you have for us as your child, as your son or your daughter. We ask that you would move this morning in us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. And as you feel led, you come forward. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I Bring new wine out of me in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making 
Jesus, bring new 